also. And then, um, and it's been a real pleasure to to meet our uh, our speaker tonight. We're honored to have uh, Al Obius here from Miami, and he's going to be talking to us tonight about his book, uh, The Boy General. This is part of a trilogy that Al has written, and this is about uh, two officers that came up as captains. George Armstrong Custer and Wesley Merritt. They became were captains and they became generals. And then the rivalry and the intertwining of their lives from those moments, uh, from those days until after the Civil War. And that's what the, the talk's going to be on tonight. So would you please give a warm welcome to uh, Al Obvious, please. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, are we going to be able to turn these lights off? Over there. Yeah. All right. Is that high enough so that uh, everybody can see what we got going on up here? Okay, well, uh, thank you all for inviting me to address your Civil War Roundtable here in Chicago. It's a real honor uh, tonight, and I, I'm glad I don't have to say this because it's already said for me. It's a mouthful of a title, The Boy Generals. I'm just going to call it The Boy Generals. I'm going to skip the rest of it. Uh, this is the cover of the first installment. Uh, and the focus of my talk tonight is going to be at the bottom. Uh, quaintly during the Civil War, it was called a spirited rivalry. Uh, my research, my in-depth research proves that it was not a spirited rivalry. It was a bitter enmity that grew and grew and grew during the Civil War and continued on afterwards until Custer's untimely death at the Little Bighorn. So this is uh, the first installment. It's already uh, published. This is uh, the second installment. Uh, just briefly, the first installment is from their tenure at West Point until the Battle of Gettysburg. Dennis, I'm really sorry, but this is the last time you're going to hear the words Gettysburg out of my mouth. Okay, uh, the second volume, well, no, I'm going to say it again. The second volume is the pursuit of uh, Lee's beaten army in the aftermath of Gettysburg. It goes through the Bristol campaign, the Overland campaign, when Grant is brought east to take command of the armies and includes uh, Yellow Tavern and Trevilian Station. We're going to focus a little bit on those later on in the presentation. And it ends up in the Shenandoah Valley when Phil Sheridan is given command of the army of the Shenandoah. And it the second installment ends on or about August 16th at the Battle of Crooked Run Guard Hill. And then the third volume, which is I don't have a cover for yet, uh, goes through the rest of the Shenandoah Valley campaign through the winter of 1864-65 to Waynesboro when Sheridan's army exits the Shenandoah Valley, heads down to Petersburg, and then gets involved in uh, the Appomattox campaign and includes Dinwiddie Courthouse, uh, Five Forks, and Appomattox Station. So that's uh, installment number three. I want to be honest with you guys and tell you that when I set out to write this book, I had no intention, and still don't have any intention, of writing a history book per se. As much as you guys have read, you know there's guys out there like Eric Wittenberg, Edward Longacre, Jeffrey Wirt, and a host of others who have covered the actions of the cavalry during the Civil War in much more minute detail with a far greater amount of knowledge that I could ever bring to the subject. My goal from the very beginning was that I wanted to write a human story. And 
I found that human story in the relationship between Wesley Merritt and George Custer. Throughout the war, Merritt would be Custer's superior officer, and by the end of the war, they came to despise each other. I mean, it was a bitter, bitter enmity, and that was originally going to be the name of the book, was A Bitter Enmity. Um, what I like about this photograph for the second book is the fact they're sitting on opposite ends of the table, juxtaposed one against the other. Very symbolic. I really like this cover. All right. Basically, what we're talking about here is two guys that have completely different temperaments, completely different characters, and most importantly, for the purposes of what I'm trying to write or have written, is that they were completely the opposite in their tactical philosophies. Just to bring you, give you a little information. At the start of the war, the cavalry was relegated to the western frontier where they were protecting the westward expansion of the American public into Indian territory. You had regiments like the second U.S. Dragoons, the Mounted Rifles, and uh, maybe four other regiments of very historically named regiments. When the Civil War came about, the War Department decided that they were going to take all these storied regiments and they were going to put them together under the coverall name of U.S. Cavalry. The drag, the light cavalry, the hussars. We're talking about the cavalry before the war was based on the European model. You have the hussars, the light cavalry, you have the dragoons, taught to fight on foot with their carbines, and you had the heavy cavalry that had the breastplates and stuff. The heavy cavalry never caught on in the United States. So we end up with the Hussar and the Dragoon. And this is what I call the battle for the soul of the cavalry. Up on the top, on the right-hand side, we have Wesley Merritt in a rather plain frock coat, the two buttons of a brigadier general. And on the left is a picture of what a dragoon would have looked like back in the Napoleonic days, maybe a little bit later into the Crimean War. It's a strictly utilitarian uniform. He's armed with a saber, a carbine, and he's trained to fight on foot. Down below, we have George Custer in his famous black velveteen battle jacket. Gold lace all the way up to the elbows, the sailor shirt, the red necktie, and the long blonde hair. You know, just the perfect hussar, probably the last hussar with his death at the Little Bighorn. And this is a picture on the bottom left of what a hussar would have looked like in those days. He's got the police hanging over his shoulder. It's covered with gold lace, bright colors. He's got the big shako on his head with a gold chain around it. And uh, it's, it's a striking figure. I don't know if you all remember the movie, They Died With Their Boots On, but there's that one scene where Custer first appears at, at West Point and he shows up on horseback with all his dogs and he's dressed up in the uniform of a hussar. So Custer was a hussar. Merritt was the dragoon. It was a battle for the soul of the cavalry, and that's what split them apart more than anything else. The battles, the campaigns of the cavalry, just serve as a background for the disintegration of their relationship. I'm sure you guys have heard that old Confucius saying that in order to understand the future, we need to study the past. Well, I'm going to turn it around just a little bit for this presentation, and I'm going to start with the future and work my way to the past. And in this case, I'm going to talk about two events that occurred in 1879, which is about three years after the death of Custer at the Little Bighorn. And on the left is Libby Bacon, and she is definitely a major factor in both of the events I'm going to talk about. The first one, 
was in January of 1879 and took place right here in Chicago, and that was the Reno Court of Inquiry. Frederick Whitaker, who was Custer's first biographer, had badgered Congress into forcing the army into an inquiry with charges of cowardice against Reno and disobedience of orders at the Little Bighorn. And finally, in 1879, January of 1879, the Army finally convened the Reno Court of Inquiry at the Palmer House here in, in Chicago. And one of the members, ironically, of the three-man board that constituted the Reno Court of Inquiry was Wesley Merritt. And in his biography of Custer, and Frederick Whitaker was Custer's first biographer, he wrote The Complete Life of George Armstrong Custer, he makes the charge that when the Court of Inquiry was over, after weeks and weeks of testimony from the 7th Cavalry and officers concerned with it, he locked himself in the room with the, they called him a recorder, I guess in modern terminology he would be the prosecutor, and that Merritt was responsible for writing the report, which in essence exonerated Reno of the charges of cowardice and disobedience to orders. And Whitaker stormed out of there and started making all kinds of charges uh, against Sheridan and uh, Merritt and the rest of the crew that had anything to do with the Reno Court of Inquiry. Then in August of 1879, Libby finds out that a commission at West Point has been appointed to uh, create a memorial to George Custer on the grounds of West Point. The unfortunate part about the whole thing was that they failed to raise enough money to create an equestrian statue. So what it ended up happening was we ended up with Custer on foot, a revolver across his chest and a saber in the other hand. And Libby was aghast because, first of all, she hadn't been consulted by anybody in the creation of the statue. And she took umbrage at the fact that no one had even bothered to check with her on that. She would tell her friends that this depiction of George Custer, that he was dressed like a desperado. And she dedicates her life to removing that statue from the grounds of West Point. Now, basically, this part here is still at West Point. The statue's gone now. But the bottom part remains. And late in later years, they would add a pedestal to it, and that is the George Custer's grave site at West Point. This picture here shows where the original statue was placed on the edge of the cemetery grounds overlooking the Hudson River. Like I say, Libby just spent her entire life trying to get rid of that statue. She got to the point where she decided she was going to go straight to the top of the army, which at that point was General Tecumseh Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman. And she writes Sherman a letter calling him uncle. Dear General Sherman, she says, years ago I knew that General Merritt was his enemy. On the plains we entertained him, and he seemed to have conquered his enmity and jealousy that was so bitter in the Army of the Potomac. But when he was placed at the head of the court of inquiry, I saw all through the trial how General Merritt still felt towards his dead comrade. Well, the story is, this story is just full of ironies. In 1882, Wesley Merritt becomes superintendent of West Point. And the whole matter of the statue is dropped in his lap. At that time, Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert Lincoln, is the Secretary of War. And finally, in 1884, he orders the statue to be removed from the pedestal, crated, stored, and it's stashed in some huge military warehouse, and it has never been seen since. Somewhere, some lucky historian's going to be doing his research, and he's going to stumble on that statue, because I've never read that it was destroyed. It was just stored and forgotten and never seen again. So that was Libby. Desperado. The Desperado. She hated that statue with a passion. Oops. <laughs>
All right, so let's go back in the past now. We're going back to West Point and their tenure at West Point. Wesley Mayer was a graduate of the class of 1860. At that time, West Point was under the auspices of the uh, engineering department of the U.S. Army. And it was long on mathematics. It was long on engineering. It was long on building fortifications. And it was extremely short on soldiery. The Secretary of War at the time that Merritt went to West Point was Jefferson Davis, who was soon to become president of the Confederacy. And what he did was he instituted a fifth term to the four terms already in place. And that was the only class that ever had five terms. It was, and it was because of Jefferson Davis. And Wesley Merritt was one of the beneficiaries of that good luck of having five years at West Point. George Custer, oh, and by the way, I've never been able to find a picture of Wesley Merritt as a cadet. And I call West Point, and they don't even know if uh, there was a class picture taken that year. In order to get a class picture, you had to have the yearbook, and no one seems to have turned in a yearbook to West Point on the class of uh, 1860. Custer graduated in the class of 1861. That he graduated at all is a miracle. At that time, if you had 100 demerits, you were thrown out of the academy. And there was one year when Custer got 99 demerits. And it just goes to show you the kind of iron discipline that Custer had, that he spent the remainder of the term and never got that one demerit that would have thrown him out of the academy. In his final year, in the final week of his tenure, with war just a hop, skip, and a jump away. He's standing watch as officer of the guard. And the new class of cadets is making its way onto West Point, and two of them get into a fight. And it was clear that Custer's duty as officer of the guard was to maintain the peace and tranquility of the academy. Instead, he jumps in between the two cadets, spreads them apart, and says, Boys, let there be a fair fight. Well, the officer of the day hears the commotion going on, is offended by Custer's gross neglect of duty, places him under arrest. Custer is court-martialed, and that looks like that's it for George Custer. Then the war breaks out. All his classmates have already left for Washington, D.C., Custer is still awaiting to be sentenced. He hasn't, no one's told him what the sentence for his court martial is, is yet at this point. And they all put in a few good words for Custer. And thank the good Lord that the war broke out because he was a trained officer. He had spent four years at West Point. He knew how to march left, right, left, right. And he was considered to be one of the best horsemen of his day. And I want to say, there's a big difference between George Custer, the great horseman, and George Custer, the great cavalry man. There's definitely a difference, and we'll cover some of that later on in the presentation. But the fact that he made it out of West Point was a testament to his iron discipline. The mentors that figured in the lives of these two men is really important. They had tremendous influence on the way their careers developed. On the Custer side, we have George McClellan, and we have Alfred Pleasanton, who would eventually command the Cavalry Corps of the uh, Army of the Potomac before he was shipped out. And on Merritt's side, we have Philip St. George Cook and John Buford. Now, Philip St. George Cook is a paradox of an officer. He traveled extensively throughout Europe, and he was. Just before the war broke out, he was working on a, ca on a manual for cavalry in which he espoused the use of the mounted charge as the primary tool of cavalry. He presents it to his good buddy, George McClellan. McClellan tells him, you know, we're in the middle of the Peninsula Campaign. We're not about to institute a new manual 
at this point. So St. George Cook's manual has never been seen since. It was never used. John Buford. When Merritt graduates from West Point, he is assigned to the second U.S. Dragoons, which was stationed on the Utah frontier, and he's assigned to John Buford's Company B. When the war breaks out, it takes two months for the U.S. second Dragoons to make it to the Eastern Front where they were to be stationed. And in those two months, John Buford teaches Wesley Merritt, all of the rudiments of cavalry operations, how to walk down a horse line, how to check equipment, make sure that his men are content, that they're eating well, that their equipment is in top shape. And then, of course, the fact that Buford really was a dragoon. You know, we all remember the fact that it was Buford who, on the first day, oh, I'm not going to say it. On the first day, Buford stops the Confederates with his dismounted actions on the outskirts of that town that we're not going to mention. So these guys have tremendous influence on the careers of both of these men, in particular Alpha Pleasanton, who later on goes on to promote these two guys who are merely captains to the rank of brigadier generals. During the Peninsula Campaign in 1862, Custer was assigned to the topographical engineers. And if you read his unpublished memoirs, you read about his trip up into the uh, balloons of, uh, of Professor Lowe and how he was scared to death that the bottom would drop out of the uh, balloon and he'd plummet to his death or that some Confederate sharpshooter would put a hole in the balloon and pretty much... That would be the end of Custer. But he also didn't help himself out very much. He developed a terrible, terrible reputation for being a heavy drinker and a heavy cursor. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that he was associated for a while with uh, Phil Kearney. And Kearney was supposed to have, is reputed to have the foulest mouth in the Union Army. And Custer, Libby tells him, wasn't too far behind. And that every other word out of his mouth was a curse word. And you can see in this picture, he's gathered with his buddies on the topographical engineers. And that is not Wesley Merritt. Remember we talked about Custer being on the end of the line at Lincoln and McClellan? Well, that's not Wesley Merritt. It looks like Wesley Merritt, but it's not Wesley Merritt. But you can see the bottles of whiskey, the bottles of wine. He was a drinker. Well, we're still in the Peninsula Campaign, and it's 1862, and Custer's still attached to the topographical engineers. And one day he goes out with General George B. Bernard, who's the head of the chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac, and they're scouting all the bridges in the area to see if any of them are still standing after the Confederates withdrew, and most of them were probably destroyed. And they get to the Chickahominy River, and Bernard tells Custer to jump in there and re reconnoiter the southern side of the river. Well, Custer pulls out his revolver, jumps in the river, and spends 15, 20 minutes scouting on the southern side of the Chickahominy. In the meantime, Bernard's going crazy. He's signaling and waving to Custer, come on back. Come on back. You've already overstayed your visit. But Custer did a thorough job, and he made the statement that although the Chickahominy had been a disaster for the Army of the Potomac, his exact words were, however chargeable was some of the misfortune of the Army of the Potomac, was almost literally a stepping stone for my personal advancement. And the reason for that is that even though Bernard was going crazy telling Custer to get back to the other side, he at least has the decency to bring Custer to the attention of George B. McClellan, who was commanding the army during the Peninsula Campaign. And 
McClellan looks at Custer and says, you know, boy, you're just the kind of person I'm looking for, and I would like you to join my staff. And Custer wasted no time in accepting the position, and that was the beginning of his rise. If I press that button one more time, I'm going to go nuts. Well, things didn't go too well for Merritt. He's assigned as a staff officer to Philip St. George Cook, and Cook gets involved in the Battle of Gaines Mill, June 27, 1862. And the Confederates strike the Fifth Corps under Fitz John Porter and rout it. And Philip St. George Cook was under explicit orders that he was not to charge. He was not to make a mounted charge under any circumstances. Well, St. George Cook didn't listen. His dream was still to make that mounted charge. And he assigns the 5th U.S. Cavalry to try and save the guns. And uh, now I can finally press a button and I can't press it. Right about there is where the guns are. And this is about where the 5th U.S. Cavalry makes its charge against the Confederates. And, of course, the charge is a failure. There's just too many Confederates, and there's only one regiment of Union Cavalry. And this is the 5th Cavalry making its famous charge there. Well, this was a disaster for the for Fitz John Porter's 5th Corps. And he's looking about to find someone to make a scapegoat out of. And he decides he's going to make St. George Cook the man. So, in the end, St. George Cook... Get, they make their way down to the James River, and at the James River, St. George Cook turns in his resignation as head of the Cavalry Corps, and Merritt loses his job as a staff officer with, uh, with St. George Cook. Custer, of course, was having the same problems. McClellan's Peninsula campaign was a disaster, and when McClellan finally gets relieved of his command. Custer being a staff member with McClellan, he loses his job too. So at this particular moment in time, both of these guys are unemployed. Then along comes Alfred Pleasanton. And he was a conniver. He was a news hound. Nobody liked him. Everybody thought he was a liar. Out for himself. But by the same token, he gets appointed to command the Cavalry Corps, and he asks Merritt and Custer to join his staff. Now, this is the first time in the war that Custer and Merritt are together. Up until now, they've been operating in different areas, and they've never met each other. This is the first time they meet. Merritt lasts two weeks on Pleasanton's staff, and there are several reasons for the why Merritt only lasted two weeks. In the end, he ends up asking for a combat command, and he's given command of the 2nd U.S. Cavalry, which was the former 2nd U.S. Dragoons, where he had met Pleasanton, because Pleasanton was a part of the 2nd U.S. Dragoons. Well, there are several reasons why the first cracks start to appear between Custer and, and Merritt. And one of them, of course, is their choice of mentors because McClellan backed Fitz John Porter against Philip St. George Cook and ruined St. George Cook's career. Merritt would spend the rest of his life defending his mentor because that's what St. George Cook was to, uh, to Merritt, his mentor. Merritt didn't write too much during the war, but after the war, he wrote extensively. He founded the United States Cavalry Association and was one of the principal contributors to the Journal of the U.S. Cavalry Association. And he wrote a full-length article on Philip St. George Cook in, that, in one of the issues. And like I say, he spends the rest of his life defending the charge of the 5th U.S. at Gaines Mill. There are other reasons why their first cracks start to appear. One of the things that really galled Merritt was the fact that 
Custer being the gregarious, fun-loving type of guy that he was, had a lot of Confederate friends at West Point. Or let me say he had a lot of Southern friends who became Confederates at West Point. An example would be Gimlet Lee. Custer receives permission to cross over into enemy territory, and he serves as uh, Gimlet Lee's best man at Gimlet Lee's wedding. And here is this room, and every officer is dressed in Confederate gray, and George Custer is the only man in the room wearing Union blue, and the women are just swooning all over him, and he was the hit of the party. So the fact that Merritt disliked the fact that Custer was, had so many Southern friends, he detested the fact that these men had sworn an oath to West Point, to the U.S. Constitution. And then they resigned and they joined the Confederate Army and they're traitors in his book. And Custer's association with these Southerners makes Custer, by extension, kind of like a traitor almost. And the last thing is, well, it probably came down to something as simple as, well, maybe Wesley Merritt didn't have a sense of humor. You know, I mean, Custer did. He was a fun-loving, gregarious guy, always laughing, having a good time, liked everybody. Everybody liked him. Wesley Merritt was a staid, stoic, elegant man, soft-spoken, unless you got his dander up, in which case he could be, he was a martinet in every sense of the word, strict regulations. but. These are the first cracks that appear in the relationship between Custer and Merritt. And mind you, at this stage of the game, it's really nothing big. They just can't stand each other that much to the point where Merritt says, you know what? I'd rather be on a, on the front line on a, in a combat unit than be stuck at a mess table with George Custer cracking jokes and having the time of his life. So then we get to the Battle of Brandy Station. And I just want to make a quick aside. When I was writing this book, everybody knows that there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books about George Custer. And there's only one book about Wesley Merritt. So the two challenges I faced when I was working on this trilogy was, number one, I had to debunk or dispel much of the mythology that has wrapped itself around Custer's persona over the centuries since the Civil War. And the other thing I had to do was, given the fact that he only had one book written about him, I had to bring Merritt's personality out. I had to make him into a human being. I had to bring out his accomplishments. I had to bring out the things that he actually accomplished as a Union soldier. At the Battle of Brandy Station, one of the big mythologies about Custer, okay, they cross at Beverly Ford. Buford crosses at Beverly Ford. Custer's there. Buford crosses and he takes with him two regiments of infantry with him. And both of the officers in the infantry regiments leave stories about Custer being at Beverly Ford with Pleasanton and Buford being present at that moment. So the advance goes towards the old St. James Church down here, down this road. And in command of the 11th Illinois, or the 8th Illinois, I'm thinking, is Colonel uh, Benjamin Grimes Davis. Well, he gets ahead of his men. And all of a sudden, a Confederate jumps out from behind a tree and puts a bullet in his head and kills him on the spot. In 1957, Jay Monahan writes probably one of the first modern biographies of George Custer. It was called Custer, the Life and Times of General George Armstrong Custer. And in it, he makes the claim that when Davis goes down, Custer's there. And he takes command of the brigade that's following Davis 
heading towards St. James Church. In 1967, D.A. Kingsley, who was probably more screenwriter than he was historian, says that McClellan had told Davis, because they were friends, that Custer was to give command of the brigade to Custer because Custer was being tested for greater things to come. In 1997, a real historian, Jeffrey Wirtz, said there ain't no word of truth to the whole thing. So this is the kind of mythology that continuously surrounds Custer. And if you want to get some idea of the type of soldier that cavalryman that Custer really was, you got to learn how to cut through all the mythology that surrounds the man. And that's an example of the kind of stuff that just, you know, Custer taking command of a brigade, the man's a staff officer. He's a captain, you know. Thomas Devin is right behind him. Good Lord, Thomas Devin was one of the guys that stopped the rebels outside of that town we're not mentioning. Uh, so, Buford mounts an attack on the old St. James Church. And one of the papers that survived after Libby's death in the trunk they were just found by a woman by the name of Marguerite Merrington, who ended up writing a book called The Custer Story. And it contained a lot of the papers that Libby had kept over the years from the Civil War. Unfortunately, she was not a good archivist, and a lot of the papers were in some seriously sad shape. But one of the papers that did survive was an account by Custer's bugler, a guy by the name of Joseph Fought who was with Custer at Brandy Station. And Fought writes in his account that the next move was on with Colonel Merritt. Custer and I had the lead. This, he's talking about this attack here when Buford finally has all his regiments in line and they're attacking St. James Church. And the whole front of St. James Church is lined with artillery and the attack fails. But, you know, here's the thing. Sometimes as a historian, you can't get all the facts. You got a lot of data, but you don't have all the facts. Somehow you as a historian, you've got to put the dots, the data together into some kind of coherent story that makes sense. So what we're talking about here is we got a martinet by the name of Wesley Merritt, a stickler for regulation. He's at the head of the second U.S. Cavalry, in this charge against uh, old St. James Church. And, of course, the charge fails. There's just too much artillery facing them, and the charge fails. Well, Buford decides he's going to take the bulk of his men. He leaves Devon behind here, and then he comes off and goes up here to the right flank. And Custer goes with him. And so does Merritt. Merritt is up here in this area here. Buford's around here somewhere. Custer's with him. There is no way in my mind that a stickler for regulation protocol and a proud, proud human being and a martinet like Wesley Merritt would have ever have let George Custer take the lead of his brigade his regiment in a charge against the enemy. And my conjecture is, maybe speculation if you want to call it that, that on the ride from here where the charge failed to up here where Buford moves with Merritt and Custer, Custer and Merritt had some words, some harsh words. And I'm sure that Merritt was a plain spoken man. I'm sure he let Custer know, hey, you don't get in front of me when I'm leading my regiment. Remember I told you that when Buford crosses Beverly Ford, he's got two regiments of infantry with him. Well, the command, the officers that were attached to those two infantry regiments left vivid accounts of Custer at this point. Now, there's a stone wall here. And Merritt is 
ordered to take that stone wall and he is to take you rich. Now, when you look at, if you read about seeing a good map of the battlefield at uh, Brandy Station, you got Fleetwood Hill. It's a huge hill. And at the very end of it, there's a spur of high land called U Ridge. And Merritt is ordered to take that position. He gets into a scrap. This is a painting by Don Stivers. And many people believe that this is uh, Rooney Lee that he's fighting with. And Rooney Lee takes a saber swipe at uh, Merritt and almost knocks his head off. But the fact is, one of the officers leaves an account saying, Custer was there, prancing with excitement, his golden hair flowing in the wind, and there was no doubt in anybody's mind that he wanted to go on that movement to you, Ridge. But the fact is, he didn't. There's no account whatsoever that Custer was ever with merit on you, Ridge. And again, connecting the dots. You have to go back to the possibility they had a conversation. Merritt told Custer to mind his own business, and he doesn't go with Merritt at U Ridge. Again, you can see that little bit of a crack starting to take place in their relationship, although it really hasn't broken out into the wide open spaces yet. At the beginning, I mentioned the fact that the biggest thing that was going on between the biggest difference between Custer and Merritt was their tactical philosophies. Custer was a hussar. Merritt was a dragoon. So now we come to the precursor to the Battle of the Town we're not talking about, which was the Aldi Middleburg Upperville campaign. And the Union cavalry passes through Aldi Gap and then it splits. Now, Merritt takes the ground, takes the Northwest Pass heading towards Snickersville in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Custer heads directly west towards Ashby's Gap in the Blue Ridge Mountains. This area here, heading towards the Fur Farm, is wide open and perfectly suitable for mounted cavalry operations. This area up here is highly cultivated. There's a lot of stone walls, a lot of stout fences, wooden fences, and it, there's no possibility of conducting mounted operations. So Merritt dismounts his men, and even before Buford had his stand, dismounted stand against the rebels, Merritt is already learning the lessons that he picked up from Buford on the trek from the from the Utah Territory, and he's fighting dismounted with his command. And this is what a skirmish line of dismounted Union cavalry would look like. In the meantime, Custer's down in an area where there's plenty of room to mount a, a charge. And Kilpatrick, the rash, reckless, whatever you want to say about Judson Kilpatrick, he orders the first main to attack up towards the fur farm here. And in this famous sketch, you see the first main in the background. This is Colonel Dowdy, the commander of the first main, and he gets hit in the chest with a bullet and it kills him instantly. And this is Judson Kilpatrick on the other side of Custer, and his horse gets killed and throws Kilpatrick to the ground. All of a sudden, our boy George, he's way out in front of everybody, saber raised, right into the midst of a group of Confederates. He says the only thing that saved him was the smoke and the fact that he was wearing a Confederate-style slouch hat, and everybody thought he was a Confederate, and somehow he manages to fight his way out. But it's here. The fork in the road where the difference in their two tactical philosophies really starts to uh, differ differentiate itself. And when we go further up the road here, it, Upperville, Strong Vincent leaves a vivid account 
of his brigade of infantry attacking the front of the Confederate line while a mounted unit of cavalry took the Confederates on, uh, on their right flank and threw them into complete confusion. And he said he had never seen cavalry in action before, but it was the grandest sight he had ever witnessed, and he, not, he knew what it felt like to be a cavalryman. And nearby, on a knoll overlooking Upperville, was Pleasanton, and next to him was George Custer. And he's still a captain, it's still a few days before uh, he gets promoted, but he remembers that what happened was you had infantry with their long rifles holding the front of the Confederates while the rest, while the cavalry made a mounted charge across uh, against the flank and threw them into complete disorder. And that stayed with Custer for quite a while. Oh. Then the famous order comes down on, on the 28th. Well, the actual order, the commission actually came down on the 29th. Uh, special orders 98. George Custer, Elon Farnsworth, and Wesley Merritt are promoted from captain, jump four grades, and days before, I got to say it, Gettysburg, they become brigadier generals. And this is that picture I that you see that's... Uh, I had color eyes and is the second cover of uh, the trilogy I'm working on. So they become brigadier generals just days before the battle. So let's take a moment now and we're going to talk about a phrase that we've all heard many, many times Custer's luck. Well, what was Custer's luck? Was Custer's luck being assigned as a staff officer to George McClellan's staff during the Peninsula Campaign? No, he ended up losing his job. There was no luck in that. Come on, you can do this, Al. Was it Custer's luck to be posted to General Alfred Pleasanton's staff? No. Was it Custer's luck to participate in over 80 charges during the war? And he came out of it relatively unscathed. The only thing that happened was he got one wound at one time, went home and married Livy. No. Custer's real luck was that he was placed in command of two regiments that were armed with a Spencer repeating rifle. The 5th Cavalry was completely armed with the 5th, with the Spencer and Several companies of the 6th Michigan were armed with a repeating rifle. And around that, at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, he is the only one who is commanding a regiment that is armed with a repeating rifle, the most modern repeating rifle on the battlefield at the time. I'm not here to tell you that George Custer was a tactical genius. Guys like Wilder out in the Army of the West were also armed with the repeating rifle, and they did fantastic things with it. Tactics is really just the use of the weapons that you're supplied with by your commanding officers and what you do with them. And at in this instance, the only person that had the Spencer was Custer, and he used it magnificently at the Battle of Gettysburg on the third day on East Cavalry Field. And he develops a cohesive, based on what he had seen at Aldi at Upperville, he would use his men armed with a Spencer to hold the Confederates in front while he himself would take his mounted men who did not have the Spencers and go around and hit them in the rear. It's the old George Patton philosophy. Hold them by the nose and kick them in the butt. Well, George Custer was practicing that philosophy long before George Patton. So that's Custer's luck, the fact that he was armed with a Spencer. So now we're going to switch tracks a little bit. Bill Sheridan's taking command of the cavalry. Grant is in command of the armies, of, the, of all the federal armies. And... Sheridan makes the boast that he can whip Jeb Stewart if he's given the chance. And Grant says, well, if he said that, well, go ahead, let him do it. 
So the next day, the cavalry hits the road south towards Richmond. And they say that the, it was 15 miles long, 15 miles of cavalry, over 10,000 saber arms hit the road that day. The rebels are scrambling. They're caught flat-footed. They're on the flank. They're on the rear. The only place they're not is they're not in front of Sheridan. So they're scrambling to get around Sheridan. And David Mamotri Gregg's 2nd Cavalry Division is in the rear guard. Sheridan spurs back to the rear of the column to make sure Mamotri Gregg's got his men in the proper position and leaves George Custer all by himself at the front of the column. I'm not too sure that's exactly what you want to be doing. At some point, Custer finds out that at Beaver Dam Station, there's three locomotives and two trains filled with supplies, food supplies, and medical supplies for Lee's army. And Custer decides he's going to destroy it. He sidetracks, goes to Beaver Dam Station, destroys the trains, destroys the, the wagons, wagon trains, just filled with bacon. They said that when he set fire to those trains, that the bacon caught fire and the grease was just pouring out of the uh, train cars like rivulets on fire. Well, on that raid, they were supposed to be moving fast. There was a shoot, very little in the way of wheeled transport. The horses only had a day and a half's worth of feed. The men only had three days' worth of rations. And everything else was packed with ammunition. Saddlebags, pockets, cartridge boxes. They were carrying as much ammunition as they could carry. Well, Merritt gets all bent out of shape about the fact that Custer has destroyed millions of dollars worth of food supplies. Technically, the command is supposed to be living off the land. And Merritt ends up calling it a gaucherie. He accuses Custer of, a, of being gauche, which is a French term meaning tactless, awkward. You know, it's, it's not a good word. Sheridan doesn't agree. Custer's destroyed eight to ten miles of telegraph wire and railroads, and this is the technique that they used back in those days. They would take the creosote soap railroad ties, they would put the uh, rail ties on top, and when they were hot enough and pliable enough, they would take the rails and they would bend them around a post, and they would never be used as railroad ties as railroad lines ever again. So Sheridan was all for it. I mean, Custer—it's like Custer said—the whole amounting to several million dollars worth. So, and that was in the official reports. And of course, Merritt doesn't see it that way. No one felt like taking serious notice of the gaucherie, which lost us some of the fruits of the hard day's march. Definitely not a happy camper. First day of the Battle of Trevelyan Station. This is where things really start falling apart for these two guys. Custer marches down this, basically what is a, no more than a logging road. In fact, the column can only march two abreast instead of the normal four abreast. Merritt is moving down the Fredericksburg Road, and they're all headed for Trevelyan Railroad Station, and the, it's Custer's job to destroy the station. So Custer's making his way down here. And unfortunately, the maps that Torbert, who was commanding the Cavalry Corps at that time, well, he didn't have any maps. He was told that Custer would come onto the Gordonsville Road here, 70 yards from the railroad station. Instead, he ends up coming 700 yards from the railroad station. Fitzhugh Lee's rebel cavalry is centered at Louisa Courthouse. Merritt is working his way down the Fredericksburg Road, and he's meeting heavy, heavy opposition from Wade Hampton's men. 
on the Fredericksburg Road. This is a picture I took of the Fredericksburg Road, and it doesn't give you any idea of what it was like in those days. It was heavily forested and dense with underbrush, and Merritt falls three hours behind in his advance up the Fredericksburg Road. In the meantime, Fitzhugh Lee's finally gotten his men moving, and he's following hot on the trail of Custer, who's still pretty far away from Trevelyan Station. Thomas Rosser, Custer's old buddy from West Point, is coming down this road, the Gordonsville Road, and he's attacking the front of Custer's column. Fitzhugh Lee is on his rear and his flank, and all of a sudden, Merritt finally breaks through. The Confederates under Wade Hampton are routed, and they march nor they march south. So now Custer is completely surrounded by Confederates on all sides. And this is a sketch of the uh, uh, melee that took place at Yellow at Yellow Tavern. I mean, at Trevilian Station. So Custer does manage to make his way out of it, but in the process, he writes to Libby that. He is hit by several spent bullets, one of which hits him in the head and stuns him. Loving husband that he is, trying to assuage her fears, he tells Libby, the bruising's already gone, the bullets were spent, I wasn't really hurt. Well, okay, he's just trying to make his wife feel good about things. I mean, he is at war, he could kill killed at any minute. Second day at Trevelyan. Merritt has moved on to this railroad track, and the Confederates under Hampton have lined this entire area. Merritt is attacking along the front of the entire railroad track, and Custer is supposed to move in on the flank and support Merritt's attack. Okay, here we go connecting the dots again. George Custer was a prolific writer. He wrote two and a half pages in the official report of the actions of his brigade on the first day of Trevelyan Station. Then he gets hit in the head by a spent bullet. And the next day, he writes a paragraph, maybe a paragraph and a half on the second day of Trevelyan Station. Well, what comes to mind immediately is that Custer wasn't himself that day. He had been hit by a spent bullet. Chances are he might have had a concussion that day. But what is true is that on the second day, Custer does not participate in person on the attack on um, Merritt's flank and support. All the reports of his officers are lost at the War Department and no one has ever seen them. And Merritt in his official report states it was slow work, however. And as the enemy was not pressed on the left, meaning Custer did not help on the left, and he stopped short of using Custer's name, but it's definitely the left, he concentrated his force on the brigade. This day, the loss of the brigade was heavy for the numbers engaged. The general advance was not made. So here we are. The official reports are finally out. And in a letter to Libby, Custer says, I carried my instructions out to the letter. But the others were three hours behind time. He almost lost his entire brigade the first day. So this is the first time that we have an official statement. It's in the official records. Both of these guys are pointing fingers at each other for the fact that Trevelyan was a Confederate victory. Now we move on to the Shenandoah Valley. And we're bringing John Singleton Mosby into the into the picture here. Mosby had four companies of partisan rangers operating in the rear of the Army of the Potomac and in the rear of the Army of the Shenandoah. And on August 13th, he le whoops, uh oh, that was bad. That was real bad. On the morning of uh, August 13th, he gathers 300 of his partisan rangers and he attacks the, the train of supplies and burns over 100 of the wagons. The men go hungry. 
and Mosby's tactics are working really well. Now we come to September 19th, the, the Battle of Winchester. Stunning victory for Sheridan. He drives early, routed up the valley. Now, if you've seen a picture of the valley, you have the Blue Ridge Mountains, you have the Allegheny Mountains, and right in the middle, you got the Massanutan Mountains. And in an effort to interdict Early's retreat, he sends Torbert with the cavalry up between the Luray, it's the Luray Valley, the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Massanutan Mountain, Luray Valley, there's a gap there. Well, Torbert's supposed to take that gap, and he does because the rebels put up an incredible rear guard. Torbert decides to retreat back to where he came from. As he starts retreating, he puts his men into his wounded men into the wagons. The wagons proceed up the road, and they're attacked by Mosby. Mosby doesn't realize that right behind the wagons is Charles Russell Lowell's brigade of the, the reserve brigade of Merritt's division. In the melee that follows, they capture seven of Mosby's men. Four of them are shot, well, granted given an edict. Where any of Mosby's men are caught, you are to hang them. Well, the first four men were shot to death in the streets of Front Royal. One of them was a 17-year-old kid, and they stood him up in front of his mother, and some guy emptied his entire revolver into the kid right in front of his mother. Now, they had seen George Custer in his famous Black Velveteen battle outfit in the streets of Front Royal. Mosby accuses Custer of hanging his men. Custer murdered my men, he said in an article. And this is Front Royal in the background. This is a tree where the two men were hung. Two, men, two of the men were actually hung. And Charles Russell Lowell says, man, I'm really sorry that my men had anything to do with this. So he kind of admits that he was the one that was in part of the deal. Thomas Rosser, Custer's old buddy from West Point. After the war, he's assigned as an engineer laying out the track beds for the Northern Pacific Railroad. And he and Custer, the 7th Cavalry, is assigned to safeguard the engineers. So Rosser and Custer meet after the war. And Custer says that he and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Rosser says that he and Custer met after the war and spent many an evening under the fly tent talking about the war. And he maintains that Custer told him repeatedly over and over that he had nothing to do with the execution of Mosby's men. And yet, here's the headlines, and they never went away. Custer was accused of murdering Mosby's men. Winter of 1864 comes and goes. 1865, it's time for Sheridan to move out of the Shenandoah Valley. In order to do so, he needs to hit Waynesboro, which is on the very south end of the valley. Merritt issues orders, and being the stickler for details and protocol that he is, he stresses the strength of the horses of the command must be husbanded. It is thought that all officers and men feel and will take a proper interest in these matters. Well, guess who didn't take proper interest in that matters? George Custer. George Custer knew for a fact where Jubal Early and the remnants of his army were in Waynesboro, and rather than husband the strength of his horses, he advances through the muck and the mud and the rain and everything and attacks Early at Waynesboro outflanks him on the on this side here, routes him across the, the river, and that's the end of the Shenandoah Valley campaign. So basically what's happened is that at this time, Custer's had enough of merit, and he has set on a program of insubordination. 
That's what he's going to do for the rest of the war. He's going to be insubordinate to Merritt. He thinks he's a much better soldier than Merritt, has always felt that his victories have always been greater than Merritt's, and that he deserved command of the division. And probably in the end, as Merritt became Cavalry Corps commander, he probably felt he should have been Cavalry Corps commander too. So that's that's where Custer's at right now. He's already made up his mind. He's going to be an insubordinate subordinate. And this is taking us pretty close to the end here. We have the uh, the Appomattox campaign, and there are several things that happened here. I'll go through them real quickly, and then I can get some get you guys to ask some questions if you want. But at the Battle of Dinwiddie Courthouse, Custer and his men had been relegated to guarding the wagon trains. Merritt gets himself into trouble, and Custer is called for, by Sheridan to come to the front. When he gets to the front, he finds this beautiful green meadow in front of him. And he's made up his mind that he's going to charge across that green field and hit the rebels as hard as he can. Now, we don't know whether Merritt had been there for quite a while. He knew the condition of the roads. He knew the condition of the fields. We don't know whether Merritt just didn't tell Custer or Custer just ignored Merritt. I mean, we're not quite sure what happened. But what happens is Custer takes that charge, and the minute he cuts into that green field, he finds that underneath it is nothing but quicksand, muck, mud, and all his horses go plunging into it. The men are dismounted, and the whole thing is a fiasco. A few days later, at the Battle of Namazine Church, just before the Battle of Namazine Church, Thomas Devon's men have been in action all day. They've been in action all night. Merritt tells Devon to camp his men. He goes up to Custer, and he says he wants Custer to take the lead and continue the attack. Custer turns around, looks at Merritt, and says, you need to finish your own work. Finish your own work, he tells his commanding officer. And then at Appomattox Station, it's almost like a repeat of Beaver Dam Station. Custer finds out that Lee's being supplied by a couple of trains full of food, supplies, ammunition, the works, and Custer's aware of it. All of a sudden, Merritt ends up, and of course, Army protocol goes into it. It was, it was Custer's turn to lead that day. He had been at the rear of the column the day before. It was his turn to be in the lead on that day. Merritt sends a staff officer to Custer and tells him that he is to pull his division off to the side of the road. And he's supposed to wait by the side of the road until the other two divisions have passed. And then he's to take the rear. Well, Custer wasn't having anything to do with that. He tells his men to take the gallop. They head for the train station. And Custer knows full well that there is no way that a staff officer is going to go back to Merritt and then come back to Custer and tell him to pull over to the side of the road again. Custer leads the attack at Appomattox Station, destroys the trains, and for all intents and purposes, the Civil War is just about over. Whoops. Last picture. Oh, I don't know what happened there. We'll live with it. This is the famous incident of the surrender where Custer receives the white flag from the Confederates. He rides down and meets with James Longstreet. Longstreet tells him he's in enemy territory and what the heck is he doing there? Uh, in his own memoirs, Longstreet doesn't really go very far. But his aide, Edward Porter Alexander, says Longstreet rebuffed him, however, very roughly, far more so than appears in Longstreet's account of the interview. And one rebel said that Custer took off with his tail between his legs. And that, folks, brings us to the end of the presentation. So I hope I didn't get it too, too long-winded on that one. Okay, if anybody has any questions, love answering questions. <laughs>
Sir. Now, what what was Sheridan's view of this rivalry uh, in his command? Like, like I said, with Merritt being uh, superior to Custer from you know the Shenandoah Valley onward, what was Sheridan's thoughts about how that relationship was working or not working? Was there anything in your research that well, commented on that? First of all, Sheridan had huge respect for both men. But it is indicative of how he felt about Merritt that during the winter of 1864 and 1865, Merritt and Sheridan go to Washington. And there's stories about, you know, the carousing that went on, the nights spent in the House of Venus, you know, the okay. drinking, all these things that are going on between Merritt and Sheridan. And they're good friends, and they stayed friends until Sheridan's untimely death at the age of 56. But obviously, Custer's a married man, very much in love. He can't be partaking in these festivities with Merritt and Sheridan. They're both bachelors, and they're having the time of their life in Washington, drinking and, you know, going to brothels and all kinds of stuff. And obviously, Custer couldn't be a part of that. But during the Shenandoah Valley campaign, Sheridan does give command of the 1st Cavalry Division to Merritt. Custer, obviously, extremely rankled that he didn't get the command because he felt he deserved the command. But then Sheridan makes a statement that in a few weeks' time, Custer would receive command of the 3rd Cavalry Division when James Wilson is shipped to the Western armies. Well, my question is, what happened in those intervening weeks? Why couldn't Custer have taken command of the 1st Cavalry Division from the beginning? I mean, what, it, what was he going to learn in two to three weeks' time that would make, you know, Merritt a better soldier than Custer, who thought he was a better soldier? So uh, Sheridan had great respect for both men, but he always kept Merritt superior. And in one incident during shortly after the Battle of Cedar Creek, Custer takes the flags to Washington before the Secretary of War. And I think I told you this story. Uh, Stanton says that as the men are presenting the flags, he, he says, in order to show you how good officers make good soldiers, I'm promoting your commanding officer to Major General. And Grant hears that Sheridan made that statement in public, and it was in the newspapers that Custer had been promoted major general, and at this moment, Merritt has not been informed that he, too, is going to be promoted major general. And all of a sudden, Grant is fuming mad, and the entire army, hierarchy of the army is scrambling to post-date Merritt's commission to three days before Custer's commission so that, that Merritt would retain his superior status over Custer. So, like I say, Sheridan appreciated both men. He just more friends with Merritt than he was with Custer because of Custer's married status. Any other questions? Come on, guys. Give me one. You made, you made a point early on that was the beginning of uh, and were you were speaking to based off the of doctrine or the individuals based on who they were because the recent faithful experience did not count as some claims against the Native Americans who met the year war, the US dragoons were used primarily as battle cavalry. And at the time their weaponry was a Greek border, the whole carbine, which yes, was a Greek border, but it was Fast forward, you know, mid 1855, you have the ball, right? Musket, you have the first carbines with metallic or semi soft but a structured cartridge. Is it more that, as evidence at Gaines Mill by the start of the third cavalry, that by the time of the Civil War and definitely afterwards, cavalry can no longer disperse. Form troops with rifle muskets because they can affect this range so much more. So, was it, was it more that you sort of learned 
in the early days of the Civil War, passed on to merit that it would be for the weaponry to become the Dragoon in the Civil War, but it was Custer's personality, his flair, his his glory seeking, so to speak, that made him the star of the story. It's like I say, at the beginning of the war, the War Department turned it all into U.S. cavalry, and every trooper was armed with a saber, a revolver, and a carbine. So from that point of view, there was no difference between the European model of light cavalry, the hussars, versus the dragoons, the dismounted cavalry with the carbine. They were all massed into one. So yes, it is a personal tactical philosophy. Custer is a hussar to the bone. He believes in the shock effect of a mounted charge. His aim is to cleave the skulls of his enemy with a saber. Merritt is a dragoon. He was trained as a dragoon in the second U.S. Dragoons in Utah. He was trained as a dragoon by Buford. He was forced into the dragoon mode at the battles of Aldi, Upperville, and uh, Middleburg. And he would have his men strap their sabers to the saddle, and wherever possible, he would fight his men dismounted. One of the things that Custer was really upset about when he says that they were three hours behind the time in advancing up the Fredericksburg Road at the Battle of Trevilian Station was because Merritt extended his line out on both sides of the road and had them fight dismounted in this dense underbrush where they ended up first with revolvers and then finally in sabers because there was no room to fire any day, a car, even a carbine. You know, the South Carolinians were armed with uh, infantry and fields. They couldn't use them. They, Merritt's men couldn't use the carbines. It degenerated into a hand-to-hand -hand fight. But remember that picture I showed you of the Fredericksburg Road? If that had been Custer, he would have gone straight down that road and he would have been at Trevilian Station in less than an hour. So, yes, it, it was not doctrine. There was no doctrine. There was never a cavalry manual written. St. George Cook was in the process of writing one, but it was never accepted by McClellan, and it died. And the men were trained by different tactical manuals. The 1st Michigan, for example, had been in the war for quite some time. And they had trained using uh, the double ranks, whereas the 5th, 6th, and 7th were trained in Michigan under a different set of tactical rules, and they were using the single rank. So, yes, the answer to the question is it was a personal choice. Custer was a hussar to the bone. Merritt was a dragoon to the bone. And that was the difference between the two that drove them apart was as Custer tried to override Merritt's continued use of the dismounted tactics when he felt that uh, a mounted charge would have been more effective. So it was not official U.S. Army doctrine. It was personal all the way. Yes, sir. Uh, I know you kind of talked about all night on um, my presentation, but did they ever try to just sit down and 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 try to uh, officer officer try to you know for the, for the common good of, of, of the count, we're going to work together we have different tactics but we need to instead of this animosity where even more customers hot bomb is or eat my fan off I mean. Was there ever a time that they had that kind of come to Jesus? Well, I guess because no. it seems like the subordinates underneath them, they're risking their lives too. And, and here they got two commanding officers, with, you know, different styles. It, it seems like somehow they've got to figure out what it was together. Kind of like that. No, they never did. In fact, things got even worse after the Battle of Cedar Creek. Like I told you guys, Merritt was on the right flank, Custer was on the left flank. And somehow Custer got into this open field, and here's our Early's routed army, and Custer gets around in front of him, and he captures 45 guns and 15 battle flags. And Merritt, can't, he can't fathom it. He says, I was there. 
my men were there. They fought just as hard as your men fought. Can't you throw a few of the guns my way? And Custer says, no, if I don't get full credit for the guns that I took, I don't want any of them. And in fact, I'm going to take you out back of the tent and I'm going to beat the heck out of you. You know, Roger Hannaford says it almost came to a duel. You know, the thing was, dueling was illegal in the U.S. Army at the time. And there was no way that two made two generals of cavalry were going to have a duel. And that was it. But, uh, you know, Sheridan, when Merritt's begging, I mean, he's literally begging, throw some of the glory my way. Glory enough for some, not enough for others. And then this thing in which he's calling Custer a liar ends up in the newspapers. And the whole thing goes before Sheridan. And Sharon is, says, no, no, I saw Custer take him. And that was the end of that. And no, there was never any effort by these two guys to ever try to make any, you know, any amicable situation out of this thing. It went from bad to worse to even worse. And, you know, uh, once you read the whole trilogy, I've only touched on a couple of the incidents that I've researched, there's a lot more. You know, like I say, every battle and every campaign serves as a backdrop for how bad their, how dysfunctional their relationship ended up being. It just got worse and worse. And it continued on after the war, too. Yeah. After the war, they get assigned to Texas. Share, the war's over. The French are in Mexico. Sheridan's given the task of driving the French out of Mexico. Custer's given a division. Merritt's given another division. And Merritt tries to voice some orders off on Custer. And Custer says, you know what? I don't take orders from you anymore. So, yes, sir. Uh, no. Uh, like I said, you know, at the beginning of, at the Spotsylvania, Merritt's brigade had gotten into a bridge situation that had prevented some of Meade's infantry from advancing. If the infantry had managed to get through, there never would have been a bloody angle at Spotsylvania. And Sheridan and Meade had a major row. And they cussed each other out. And they said that Sheridan was using expletives left and right. And all the staff officers are gathered around on the outside of the tent listening to the two generals go at it. And Meade goes and tells Grant, well, you know, Sheridan said he could whip Jeb Stewart if I gave him the chance. And Grant looks at me and says, well, if he says he can do it, let him do it. So, you know, Grant was always in Sheridan's corner. Um, I don't think that the relationships between Grant and Meade were the best. I think the fact that Grant decided to attach his headquarters to the Army of the Potomac really galled Meade. I think he wrote about it to his wife that he was not happy with the situation because it allowed Grant to intervene in his chain of command whenever Grant felt that he needed to. So I don't think things between me and Grant were that good, whereas things between Grant and Sheridan were good. And, you know, you go on after the war, and, you know, we're out west, and we're, you know, the Army's in charge of basically eradicating the Indians as the United States moves west, and whose policy was that? That was Grant and Sheridan's policy. You know, so these guys were thick as thieves, and that didn't change even after the war. Any other questions? Thanks a lot, Alfred. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfred. My pleasure. Go ahead. That concludes the meeting. We'll see everybody next month for October. Carlton Young and two Vermont brothers in the Civil War.